Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Janine, and, and everyone for the opportunity to, to be with you this afternoon. I'm really looking forward to it, but I have a disclaimer and a health warning to give as we start, and that's that I am not an expert on teaching grade four to seven mathematics, but I told Janine that before she, well, when she invited me, and she said, it's okay, we believe you've got something valuable to share. So I hope that I live up to those expectations. I've entitled the talk 246X Teaching Mathematics, Primary Mathematics Towards a Secondary Horizon because I know something about that. I don't know a lot about great teaching grade four, but I do know what it, I think I know a lot about what we need to be looking at as we think about preparing learners for high school. At the same time, I hope you won't think that I am saying that all that a primary school math teacher does is prepare learners for high school because really that's not what you do. You, you work with children and you teach them mathematics and you do it every day, I'm sure, and you do it in the best way that you can. <clears throat> but I wanna share some things based on our research and based on other things that I've learned that I hope are gonna be practical and helpful for today. Sorry, we're having a bit of a tech thing. So let me tell you what you can expect. I'm gonna share some results of research that we've done with grade eight learners, and that's looking back at primary school mathematics. I wanna talk about some of the key transitions that happen in senior phase mathematics. And although I'm saying senior phase, it doesn't mean that I'm ignoring intermediate phase because I think the transition actually starts from grade four upwards anyway. I want to share some ideas for tasks, much of which will depend on variation theory, and so I'm going to share about that. And the other thing you can expect is that I'm going to talk too fast. But I won't get through this presentation if I talk slowly. So I hope that I don't talk faster than is hearable. So let me share with you about the DEBA test. So you wonder where the name comes from. We wanted to set a diagnostic and baseline test during COVID. So we're sitting in 2020 and teachers in high schools are saying to us, we wonder what grade seven, what mathematics grade seven learners will be bringing to high school in the context of COVID in 2020. So we designed the test, which we hoped would have a baseline function as well as a diagnostic function. And hence the DI from diagnostic and the BA from baseline. And we took it together and it's become that. So long story short, it's 65 multiple choice items. They span mathematics starting in grade four and going through to grade seven, but there are a few grade eight items, which is why the eight is in brackets there. The sample that I want to tell you a little bit about today comes from um, their grade eights. It's roughly, seven, roughly 800 learners. They're from six schools four of which are top performing quintile five government schools and two of which are low fee, uh, sorry, not necessarily low fee, but they are small independent schools. We collected this data in 2021 in February. So think about it in terms of the year, we are really looking at what, how much are they bringing from primary school because they haven't done very much mathematics in high school yet at the time we're testing them. So on the right hand side of the screen, you can see the breakdown of the different topics. You can see the number of items in each topic and you can see that that's not evenly distributed and that's deliberate. The main focus is on number, which is why 40, 42 items are about number. And then on the right hand column, you can see the percentage correct. And so they're in the 60s, except for measurement, which is not even 50%. Now that came as a surprise to us. It may or may not came, come as a surprise to you. But what it has shown as we've started to dig back is that in fact, the TIMS results, the ANA results, ANAs which were conducted in government schools 2012, 13 and 14, and other work that's been done in the Western Cape is all showing that learners are not performing well on measurement. And so it's something that we have got on our radar, but it's not something I'm going to talk a lot about this afternoon. I'm going to share a few things about some of those items, but I thought it would be useful just to give you some indication of the items where learn the percentage correct was less than 50%. Because I think that when you see this list, you actually realize that the stuff that learners aren't doing so well in is not necessarily grade seven work. 
If you have a look there, um, there's ratio of squares to circles, right? I think that's grade five, grade six, and only a third of learners are getting that correct. I'm going to show you the, a look-alike item. When I say look-alike, I'm meaning it looks a lot alike, the test item, but it's not the actual test item. So the ones that are in red there, and hopefully you can see the red of the question, those are the four I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm not going to talk about all of them because we don't have time, but if you want to raise something about this in the Q&A, um, feel free to do that. So, looking first at fraction. Which fraction lies between a half and one? And of course, a key thing in, this, in making this item work is the options you give the learners to choose from. So you'll see we've got four over three, which is clearly greater than one, eight over 15, which is close to a half, five over 11, which is kind of also close to a half, and a quarter, which of course is nowhere close to a half. But of course, the correct answer is eight over 15. That's the green box. But the red box is the most common answer that learners chose. Why do they do that? Well, it's based on whole number reasoning, and I'm probably not telling you anything you don't know already. The reasoning that typically follows here is four is greater than two, which are the denominators, and so a quarter is therefore greater than a half. Completely logical if that's how you think fractions work, but of course they don't work that way. So it's this whole number reasoning that's becoming an obstacle in working with fraction. It's same with decimal, and I'm sure, as I said, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but we're seeing that in grade, in grade eight, in top schools, they've come from top primary schools as well. The next item is probably unfamiliar. It has a very unfamiliar format because why have you got a diamond divided by one? And for those who maybe have taught some high school, it's that diamond is kind of representing an X, right? So you're saying if this thing is any whole number and you divide it by one, what's the answer? It's a generalization and the options we gave learners were pretty obvious. Zero, that diamond shape itself, one, or impossible to tell. And impossible to tell in this case is a kind of valid option, right? Because, well, we don't know what this thing is, so we can't tell you what the answer is. So it's not like we were just looking for a fourth distractor. We really think it's a viable option. Of course, B is the correct answer, but not many chose it. And again, as I said, I think we, the, it's the form of the question that's an issue, but it is something that we think learners need to be encountering in primary school. They need to start being able to generalize and think about if this thing is any number and you multiply it by one, if you add zero, etc., what will happen to the answer? So this is the question um, about squares and circles. So what's the ratio of squares to circles? And of course, you've got to work hard at choosing the distractors. And I'm pretty sure you can guess how they performed on this one too, right? Oh, goodness. I didn't move the mouse and I can't see what. We're going to fix it now. OK, apparently you can see the right thing, but right now I can't see it. But what you can see is five circles and 10 squares. OK, what are the learners doing? Well, the majority of them chose D. I'm going to click the mouse again and hope that I don't mess something up. There we go. So the correct answer is C, right? Two to one. They chose the majority five to 10. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us that they're counting the shapes. The other thing it tells us is that they're not paying attention to the order in the ratio because five to 10 is not about squares to circles. It's about circles to squares. I'm, again, I don't think I'm telling you anything you don't know, but this is something that really we have to pay attention to. The next one is calculating the area of a triangle. Now, I think this is grade seven um, curriculum, but what you might see is perhaps surprising in this item is that we've put uh, all measurements, all three sides and the height, and we, I didn't indicate the, the, the right angle on the diagram, and I think we did in the test, but learners would assume that that's the height. We have given them more information than they need. And when you do that, it upsets things. Because typically, the contract we have in maths, or in, in school maths at any rate, is we only give learners the information they need, and if it's given, you must use it. So we put a whole lot of stuff there, and now they've got to decide which of these pieces of information to use in order to calculate the answer. 
It's a strategy that I think we need to spend pay more attention to when we're teaching because part of learning mathematics is about deciding what information is relevant and what is not. And if we only ever give relevant information, then we end up with a situation where we don't know what learners will do when we give them more than they need or if we don't give them enough. Because if we don't give them enough information, they need to know there's something missing. Can they recognize it? Okay, so extra information causes difficulties. I'm now going to stick with the same test, but look at a much bigger sample. So we've tested thousands of learners. I'm only going to present the results from learners who were in quintile four and five schools. So those are typically X model C schools um, from a previous political regime. So this is 12 schools, and the question focuses on the meaning of the equal sign. So what you can see on the screen there now is six at four equals box at seven. And the question is asking learners to put something in the box to make the statement, the number sentence true. Similarly, the one below that is the same on the left hand side, but we're subtracting seven. So take a look at the performance of grade eight and nine. This again is February 2021. 50% of grade eight got it correct. 61, the first one, right? And 61% of grade nines got it correct. But take a look, when you change it to subtraction, which doesn't really seem, you don't really think would make much difference, there's a massive change for both grade eight and grade nine, which says to us there's something about subtraction that means they do something different than they would do when we're adding. If you take a look at the next two columns, you see the classic error that they fall into. So if you are working from left to right, you're going to say six at four is 10. And you stick 10 in the box if you're ignoring what comes next. So take a look at the high percentage of learners who are falling into that trap. And you see that it's happening still nearly 30% in grade nine are making that error. Now, how do we teach equations to learners who don't have a, an appropriate understanding of the equal sign? So what you see in the box there at the bottom is some kind of comments on this. And excuse me turning to the screen because I have to read them. Um, so many learners have what we call a do something view of the equal sign. In other words, you do something and you get an answer and you typically put the answer on the right hand side. There are more grade nines who have an equivalence or a balanced view. But what you see here is that that balanced view is not that stable because when we change from addition to subtraction, then suddenly the results are, are not as good. So this is something that is critical in primary school maths and I'm going to come back to it just now. What I want to talk about now are key transitions in, the, in senior phase mathematics. This are, these are not my ideas. I am stealing from colleagues from other parts of the world, but they resonate with me and I'm pretty sure they're going to resonate with you if you're teaching grade seven and if you've taught bottom end of high school or if you have children who have, who have gone through grade seven, eight, nine. So the, the first thing that's important to understand overall is that there's a transition from a numeric and calculation based form of mathematics to one that is more abstract and symbolic and therefore more complex. That is overall the big thing that shifts. And it's really important for us to recognize that these are some of the struggles that grade six, seven, eight, nine, actually also 10 learners are going through as they're learning all this mathematics. So the first transition, Learners start with whole number and they do so in grade one. Yet, in, in fact, they do so in, in preschool. Then we go to fractions. Then we go to negative numbers. Then we go to real numbers. So square root of eight is not something that you might give learners in grade seven. Um, although when you give them square root of eight, they tell you it's four, right? So, so you probably do that. Um, but it's also understanding there's something else that's going on. The square root of eight and where does it fit on the number line? It's not a perfect square, da, 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 da. The second one is the shift from operating on numbers to operating on algebraic symbols. And for most of us, that's the one we recognize most easily because you hear so many people saying, when algebra arrived, I, I left maths kind of stuff. So if you have a look at the box on the left, five add 16 multiplied by four, we get an answer of 69. We can do the calculation and we get an answer which is a single number. On the right hand side, 
uh, sorry, in the right hand box, I've changed the four to a K. So now we've got five add 16 K. And that's it. That's all we can do with it. So we have an answer that kind of seems unfinished because there are two terms. And from a primary school experience, it's like there's, still need, there's an operation you still got to perform. And so what many kids do is they perform it. And they go 16 at 521K, thank you for playing. Because that gives them the single answer that they are so used to from primary school. And I'm not saying introduce letters in primary school, but this is something that we need to think about. And so getting learners to be happy with working with expressions and, and tasks where actually you don't do the calculation. You just work with parts, of, with parts of stuff that are kind of unfinished. This is something that's really important. Unfortunately, we don't have a whole lot of time to talk about it today, but hopefully I've just put it on your radar. Next transition is from using rules which are based on counting and numerical examples to rules that are de derived through logic and deduction. So I hope you appreciate my emojis in this one. If you think about four times three, when you teach introduce multiplication in primary school, you typically talk about it as grouping. And so you'd say something like four groups of three, I've shown them for you, we're good to go, we're happy, right. Now we start moving, as you get into grade seven or grade eight, four times negative three. Well, I guess you can kind of say that's four groups of negative three. I don't know what that looks like, but I can live with it. Four groups of negative three, I can kind of figure out. But then we move to negative four multiplied by negative three, and then I'm out of here. Because there is no ways I can think of negative groups. It doesn't make any sense. So I can no longer count them. I now need a rule, and I need a rule that makes sense. And saying a minus times a minus is a plus is not really a rule that makes a whole lot of sense. But I'm not going to go into that. That's a discussion for another day. But seeing this transition from working very simply with grouping and re a repeated addition, it doesn't continue in as we go into negative number. And so if learners only have an idea of multiplication as repeated addition, they're in trouble. The final major shift is a folk, and this is a whole lot of words I've got to read. It's a focus on the features of tangible shapes, stuff you can fold, that you can touch, that you can rotate, to a focus on properties and the relationships between those properties. And then the logical arguments, etc., that follow, and you can imagine Euclidean geometry is where we go. So what I try to capture in those diagrams is really pieces of paper that we can fold to diagrams where we've now got to talk about exterior angles, which are defined in a particular way. And this is a massive shift in space and shape work for learners as they move into the, the senior phase and then, of course, beyond. So bottom line, if learners don't master the foundational knowledge, they're not going to cope with the transition that they hit when they get to high school. We know that many, many kids, in fact, the majority in this country don't master those transitions, which is partly why the majority of kids are in doing math lit and not mathematics. And many of those who do mathematics don't pass it. Right, let's lighten it up a little bit. So do you remember this stuff? There are two pictures and I want you to spot six differences. And while you do that, I'm taking a sip of water. So, I mean, this is where you wish you were live, right? Because you wish you could like shout them out. Unfortunately, we can't. But I can tell you the tech people in the room with me have got their noses on the screens looking very carefully at, at particular differences. So I'm sure you've seen a bunch of them and maybe you haven't seen all six. But the point that I really want to get at here is that we can see differences because most of the picture and the bottom picture is the same as the top picture. It's only a few things that are different. And it's that contrast of invariance or a little bit of variance in a lot of invariance that makes it possible to see those changes. I could have asked you different questions though, and these questions might have been more helpful. For example, I could have said to you, what's missing on the right-hand side of the picture? And then you would have figured that the lamp, that lamppost's not there. I'm sure you got it anyway, but, but maybe, maybe you didn't. Or I could have said to you, how many people can you see? And that might have pointed you to the, to the thing that at the top of the slide, there's a little girl who is missing in the second picture. 
Or I could have said, how many semicircular shapes do you see? And that would have pointed you to the bottom left-hand part of the picture, which I think are those tire things that get half buried in the ground and which kids jump on. So the point I'm trying to make here is that we can see difference because most of the stuff hasn't changed. And I want to take this now into variation theory and then into mathematics. So this idea of learning through variation, I think, is very powerful. It's work that's come from, that is very, very trendy, I guess, internationally. You can find a lot of it on the web, and it's not limited to mathematics. So I'm sure many of you on this call teach other subjects as well. And I'm sure as I talk, you will see opportunities where you can think about variation in the other subjects you teach. So here is the first statement about variation. That learning is becoming aware of aspects that you went, weren't aware of before. Like, that's not rocket science, right? That's pretty obvious. But let's, let's unpack that. So first of all, we, can, we cannot see variation if everything changes at once. So those of you who might be familiar with the Where's Wally um, work, that image is just chaotic, right? There's so much stuff going on there that your eye kind of goes to the bottom of the picture or up to the top into the sea because you your brain can't cope with everything that's coming in in the middle. There's not a whole lot you can learn there, and it's pretty hard to find Wally often. That's the, the, the challenge of, of the thing. But if we make small and noticeable changes in key aspects, we can start to learn stuff and to see stuff. And then we've got to focus, as we did with the spot the difference, what changes and what stays the same. So there's a lineup of cars, and there's not much that changes, right? But I'm pretty sure your eye has gone towards the back of the picture where one of the cars is kind of out of line and you can see the, the wheel and you can see part of the hubcap. And why do you notice that? Well, because everything else is the same. So your eye's gone there, I'm pretty sure. In order to see what something is, we have to see what it is not. So if you want to see cars in line, well, you've got to also see cars that are not in line. But here's a better example. In order to see what a red car is, you've got to have a non-red car, hence the blue. Now I'm pretty sure your eyes go to the blue, and it's not really worrying about that wheel in the background anymore. So this is the non or counter example that I'll, I'll talk about a, a little bit later. And this is the essence of variation, okay? Not much changes, but something important changes, and that's what we want learners to pay attention to. So how do we do this in maths? Well, here's an example, and I'm deliberately using a particular way of, of doing it, but I hope it's going to work. So if I want learners to recognize that multiplication doesn't always make bigger, then I need to think quite carefully about how I'm going to do this. So here's a suggestion. Clearly, you're not going to do this with grade threes and fours, but here's a suggestion of a task. I want learners to calculate the following. So if you've done that one, I'm sure you've got seven and 12. And here's some more pairs. And what I'm going to ask you is a bunch of questions. These are teacher questions, right, that I'm asking teachers, not teacher questions we ask kids. So look at the questions and think to yourself, what is changing and what is staying the same? If you look overall at the questions, you should be seeing, well, the first one's always addition and the second one's multiplication. That's the same pattern throughout. The first number is always four. I'm not really worried about the first number. I'm worried about the second. So that's why I don't change the first one. I wanted them to pay attention to the second. And then ultimately, as I do all these, what can be generalized from the example set? So I want learners to see that in the first one, multiplying made bigger, right? The, the product was bigger than the sum. In the second one, the sum's bigger than the product. That doesn't normally happen, right? In the third one, the sum is also bigger than the product because it's four versus zero. And then in seven, we get four and a half and two. So this is not the classic thing you're going to do when you first introduce multiplication, but it is a way of getting learners to think about the idea or the overgeneralization that multiplication always makes bigger. So here's a potential learner task. And I would ask learners to give me another pair where multiplication does give a bigger answer than addition. Because if they can do that, then they've got the essence of what's going on in the beginning. 
And then I want them to give me another example where multiplication is going to give me a smaller number. And I think that won't be as easy, but they might be able to figure out if I multiply by fractions, I'm making smaller. And it's really important that learners start to understand that multiplication can make bigger, it can make same, but it can also make smaller. And I haven't got into integers in this part yet. There's another way of using variation, which is about providing practice. So here's an example, 20 plus 32 equals 52. I'm just giving that as an example that learners can see. And I wanna know from them what I can put in those boxes, which when I add will also give me 52, and I want them to give me as many as they can. Now, just to state some of the obvious things, I've deliberately chosen 52 because there are many pairs of numbers that can give me 52, and so I give learners an opportunity to practice their bonds. It's also an opportunity to, for many to participate because there's so many different answers. And so getting kids to get their hands up, this is a, a good option to do that. But in the next option, I wanna do something entirely different. So I'm giving them six multiplied by two is 12, and I wanna know what else I can multiply together to get 12. Well, I've already, used up one of them, right? And we got four and three, and we got three and four, and 12 and one, and then we kind of run out. And that's deliberate, because I want them to start to think about fractions. And so the choice of 12 as a relatively small number is important here, because I want them to start to think about 24 multiplied by a half, and, and various other things. So by limiting that number, I'm pushing the learners to start to think about fractions. And so the variation that's going to come in will be the combinations they choose, and what's not going to change is the answer. So we're giving them the answer, we want them to give us the question. I also want to emphasize this thing about write down as many as you can, because I think what often happens is that learners write two and then they stop. And you kind of have to push them. And I think it's really important to get them. We want each of them to recognize that they've run out of whole number pairs pretty soon and to start to get to fractions and decimals. But the other thing that has worked pretty well for us, and this is with high school and primary school, is to say, choose numbers that no one else will think of. Because when you give that challenge, they start to come up with 12 million multiplied by something is going to give me 12. And at least think, okay, they're thinking about big numbers. Even if they're still whole numbers, they're big ones. And of course, they need a fraction to, to be the other part of the product. We can also use variation to focus on a concept. So let me just give you a second to take a look at the pattern there. What you should notice is that the first two are exactly the same, right? But then it starts to change. <clears throat> and that's very deliberate because what's going on here is something that's really important mathematically. And it's not maybe obvious to learners, but as you get into it, you start to realize the first one's about multiplication. The second one is about addition, but the first two terms are the same. And if you go further in mathematics, there's a whole bunch of stuff that says if you've only got two terms, you can't define this, the, the, the pattern because it's not enough information. So, so in terms of thinking at the teacher level here, what's the same, what's different, what comes into focus? Well, it should be that you can't add in both of them. So the one's about addition subtraction, the other's about multiplication division. And the thing that I think we then need to be doing is saying what comes next so we're extending the pattern to the right and getting more so that if learners can do that, it shows us that they figured out in the one we're multiplying and the other we're adding. But actually, I also think we need to be going to the left. In other words, we're saying what comes before. Because if we think of a pattern as infinite in both directions, then we can get smaller, which means we're going to be dividing by four and we're going to be, sub sorry, dividing by two, right? And subtracting four. And of course, we're going to hit zeros and ones, but we're also going to hit negative numbers. And there's no train smash in doing that. Because if you've got a number line on your wall, even if you're teaching grade four, that has negative numbers on it, the learners will soon figure out that if you just go in hops of four or whatever it is, you can go on forever and you can keep going on in the direction that's opposite to the direction they would normally take. 
I, this is where I want to come back to the equal sign to use variation to emphasize a concept. OK, so we talked about the equal sign as balance. So here's an example of a task with variation in it where I'm trying to shift learners idea of how they see the equal sign. And I don't think it's that hard to do, frankly. I think it's important that we're strategic about how we do it. So what value must I put in the box to make the statement true? Well, clearly the first one is 10, right? Next one, clearly it's not 10, but many learners are going to do that. I've already showed you that from the slides earlier. So the initial focus are, is 6 add 4 gives me 10. The next one is both sides must be equal to 10. That's the key shift. Then I want to start playing with things. So now I want to move the, the position of the placeholder. I want to add, use different operations. Because, of course, when I say 4 add 6 equals 1, I'm already setting up some kind of cognitive conflict because 6 add 4 is not 1. Whereas when I put the box straight after the equal sign, I'm seducing them into giving 10. Now I've messed around a little bit more. I want to have some multiplication. Then I want to have some multiplication and division and addition and whatever, because I want to get into them to encounter the idea that it's about what's the result on the left and the result on the right. That's what must be the same. I can have different numbers, different operations, doesn't matter. So just pulling in now the variation thing. The left side hand side has not changed. I don't think it needs to because there's too much noise if everything's changing. In the first two lines, I've got the key shift. I'm moving from gives me, a gives me view of the equal sign, to a view that says is the same as, in other words, equivalence or balance. And thereafter, there's just more variation going on. There are more, more things varying, right? So more letters, more operations. And that for me is a key idea in illustrating how the variation is working to get something conceptual done in a very targeted way. I, had, I could not resist but to talk about BODMAS with you um, because I know that it's a thing that drives us all crazy, right? So in the DBIT test, the very first item in the test is this item. It's not really this item, but it looks like this. And I don't know if you will believe me that 56% of grade eights got it right. And it doesn't matter what school, how strong the school is, it's the same. We have used this test in a whole bunch of schools. The kids do something crazy on item one. And I keep thinking it's because it's item one and maybe, uh, maybe it is. But 38% chose 10. And it's obvious why they get 10, right? Because they go 24 plus 6 is 30 and they divide by 3. So now we've got to get this issue attended to. And I'm not suggesting that there aren't, that teachers aren't teaching BODMAS. Of course you are. And I'm pretty sure that you think your kids have got it, at least to some extent. But I think one of the issues is that we keep giving them examples where we have decided the order and now they've got to spot it. And I want to suggest we need to turn that around. So, sorry, here's the task. And this seems to have worked a little bit where we've, where we've tried it in schools. So we use the number, you're given one, two, three, and four. Okay, that's all you can use. And the operations of addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and you're allowed to use brackets. And you have to use every number, but you're only allowed to use it once. So the example that's there gives you three. And that one is already kind of seductive because we've got the one add to then multiply it by three. But it seems to me that if learners produce the expressions, they start to pay more attention because, of course, they just ignore the order of operations when they're doing it kind of in, the head, in their heads. So questions we could ask, can you make 11? Can you make three in another way? What other numbers can you make? Which is a great way of showing you how your errors can be productive because they set out to get six, but they got 17. And that's OK because it's another number. So you know, errors are valuable, which I really do believe. Um, then more targeted thing, can you make every number from 1 to 30? And I don't think you can. But they don't know that yet, and they need to work on it, and they need to be strategic. But here's what we see when learners do it. You see, and I, you've seen this, I'm sure. 3 multiplied by 2 is 6. 6 add 4 is 10, subtract 1 is 9. So hopefully you have spotted the mathematical error, which you might not think is a big deal, but those of us in high school 
do backflips when we see it. Six add four is not nine. That's effectively what they've done. Although they've got some stuff in the middle, they're saying that six add four ultimately equals nine, which is not correct. And we want to discourage them from getting into that stuff. So in fact, we want to discourage the way of writing everything in the top box. And we want to get them to write the whole expression in one line. So in this case, 3 multiplied by 2, add 4, subtract 1. That's the version you would give them as a teacher when you say this is a bod mass kind of question. And you wouldn't give such a, such a simple version, right? You'd put the addition first. But if we can get them to produce it in, the, in that line, then they have to pay attention to whether the expression they've written actually produces the answer that they claim it does. And I think that's where they can start checking each other to decide whether the answer comes out correctly or not. I'm done. But what I want to say to you is two things in terms of thinking about primary school maths and secondary maths. The first is focus on generalizing and relationships at least once a week. At least once a week, please. So calculations become a means to an end rather than just an end in themselves. And the second thing I want to say to you is variation is your friend every day in every lesson. There is truckloads of, of, of resources out there on variation on the internet. Google variation and mathematics, you'll see truckloads, okay? particularly stuff from the UK. There's stuff from South Africa, but go for it. I would love to know and to hear more from this group of teachers who've used it and have, have been has seen it being productive, but also it won't always work. And I think it's important to tell those stories too. But I really do believe that this is potential. And so I hope that what I've shared has been useful, not just to inspire you, but to give you something you can use in your classroom tomorrow and next week and next month and next year. Thank you.